Amen. Well, listen, uh, next weekend is Easter weekend, and we are baptizing people all weekend long. So if you have never been dunked, we would love to do that for you, all right? Uh, you can still sign up for that. We're doing it every location, every gathering. So go to the Next Steps area before you leave. Jump on the app, sign up. We'd love to help you take that step. But let me just speak to Easter weekend, if I can, very quickly, okay? Uh, Easter weekend, we are praying that more lives would be changed like that. Amen? Like we just heard and we just saw. And so there are some things that, that we need from you, I need from you. Number one, if you have not RSVP'd for a gathering yet, I need you to do that like right now. And I mean like if you're forgetful and you need to pull your phone out and open the app and do it right now while I'm talking, you can do that. Uh, this is no joke. We are expecting upwards of 6,000 people next weekend, which is crazy. And so number one... Number one, we need to make sure that we have a seat for everybody that wants to attend, so we can't have everyone showing up at the same time, but then we also wanna be well prepared to serve everyone, and you RSVPing helps us with both of those things, and so please, if you have not done it, take time to do that today. That would be super helpful. Um, also, I would say if you need to pester someone, like my boy Dawson, you know, the friend, the neighbor, the coworker, the family member to get them to come to church with you next weekend. Go ahead and send the text or make the call this week. Just pester them. They need to be here. And let's all be in prayer that God would show up and move in extraordinary ways. Like, I'm believing that he will, but I want us as a church to go into next weekend prayed up. So can we do that? All right, awesome. Well, listen, with all that said, if you have a Bible, grab it. Head to John 21, if you will. John 21, it's crazy, we are closing out the Gospel of John series today after 60 weeks, and I hope that you have enjoyed the series as much as I have enjoyed preaching the series. Uh, this is no joke, this has probably been my favorite series I have preached in the history of our church, and to see what God has done through it has been nothing short of supernatural, all right? I was sharing with some of our elders this morning, and I was looking back at numbers this week, we kicked off the Gospel of John series in the fall of 2022, and since that time, our church has grown by 1,500 people, and we have baptized 351 people. Absolutely unreal. And, and I just want to say, listen, I want to say, that is what happens when the Word of God is proclaimed and Jesus is lifted up. Like when the word of God is preached and Jesus is lifted up, God draws people to himself and he changes lives. And so I'm sad to see the gospel of John go, but we're still gonna lift up Jesus and we're gonna preach the word of God moving forward, all right? So don't be too sad about it. But again, John 21 is where we're gonna be. If you have a Bible, you can find your way there. But as many of you know, we are three months into a two-year discipleship journey called All to Him. And if you're not in with us yet, we're still in the beginning stages. You got time to jump on and, and uh, to get in on what God is doing. But over the next two years, there is one big question that we want every person in our church to ask. Am I giving my all to the one who gave his all for me, or are there areas of my life that still aren't fully surrendered? And so in other words, what we want is for you to start with Jesus. We should always start with Jesus, amen? And, and so we want you to start with Jesus and to see him there to see his person, his work, his sacrifice to save a person like you, and in response to what he's done, to then examine every area of your life, to look at your marriage and your money and your parenting and your work and your dating life, the way that you love your neighbors, and to simply ask this question, is there anything I'm holding back from him? Is there anything that I still have a death grip on that I have not released to King Jesus because of pride or selfishness or fear or greed? And can I just remind us there's a lot at stake in us answering that question honestly? I mean, the glory of God is at stake first and foremost. That matters more than anything because as we all know, God gets no glory from the person who holds their life back from him. Number two, your joy is at stake. I mean, we just heard it in, in the story video that your joy is directly related to you doing uh, life God's way. We talk about this all the time, like, like your flourishing is dependent upon your obedience. And so if you fail to obey God and you do life your way instead of his way, you're going to live a very frustrated life. But finally, I would add that our mission as a church is at stake. Like, come on, I think you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway the world that is in desperate need of Jesus fails to see him in us when we are not surrendered to his lordship as his people. 
Like it's impossible to make him known in a world that needs to know him if we're not submitting our lives to him each and every day. And so as we walk through this final sermon in in our study on John's gospel, I just want to get you wrestling again. And I want to get you asking the question, man, am I truly building my life on him? Is my whole life built on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ? Am I walking in obedience? Am I truly following him as Lord and King? Or is there something that I'm still holding back? And so with that before you, we're gonna dive in and get to work. All right, John 21, we're gonna pick it up in verse 15. Here's what he writes. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So what's happening in these verses is that Jesus is reinstating Peter as the leader, the future leader of his church. Okay, if you go back and read Matthew 16, 13 through 18, this is where you see Jesus establishing Peter as the leader. And it all comes on the other side of this incredible miracle. Jesus feeds a massive crowd of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And then after the miracle, he's with his disciples and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And his guys are like, well, some people think you're Elijah, and some people John the Baptist. Others are saying Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asks the million-dollar question. There's not a, a more important question that you and I have to answer in our lives than this question, who do you say that I am? And Peter pops off because he was always talking first, and he always talked the most. And he's like, I know the answer. And he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was like, ding, 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 ding. Peter, you nailed it on the head, bro. You're exactly right. And I love what he says. He's like, hey, man, you did not figure that out on your own. Like, you didn't come to that conclusion all by yourself, but that was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And then he said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he told Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And anything you bind on earth, it's gonna be bound in heaven. Anything you loose on earth is gonna be loosed in heaven. So Peter, because of the work that you're setting out to do, eternal things are going to shift and change. But then as we've talked about in recent weeks, a short time later, Peter denied Jesus. The very one who gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the night of his arrest, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter denied ever knowing him. Not once, not twice, but three times. But what we just read in our text is this, and it's so incredible that Jesus on the other side of his denial doesn't take the keys away. He doesn't stand before Peter and he's like, hey bro, you failed me, I'm gonna need those keys back, all right? Uh, I don't use failures, I don't use deniers, I think I'm gonna move on to the next guy. You know, John over there, he's been faithful to me the whole time, only disciple that showed up at the cross while I was dying for the sins of the world. And so, Peter, you're out. Next guy's up. John is in. It's not what happens. No, he looks at Peter, and he's like, hey, you're still my guy. Peter, what I promised I would do through you, I'm still going to do that. The calling is still on your life. And I think that's really good news for those of us who are here today who have failed Jesus in some way and have, have been led to believe maybe by the enemy or by our own flesh that somehow that failure has disqualified us. That because we've strayed or sinned against our Lord and King that he's just moved on to the next guy. Now we're out, next guy's up, it's over for us, we'll never be used again. I just wanna say what I said last week very quickly. What Peter's story proves is that your failure is not final. It's not final, like the sin in your life doesn't get the final word, but the heart of Jesus is to restore you, not just to fellowship, but he wants to reinstate you for service. Now, here's what you need to know if this applies to you, okay? Reinstatement typically requires a process. So if you're someone who fails Jesus or sins against Jesus, being reinstated for service usually requires a process, and we see Jesus putting Peter through a process, all right? He asks him the same question three times. And do you know why he asked him the same question three times? Because there were three denials, and I think this is a beautiful reminder that he has grace for all of our sin. 
He's like, all right, Peter, I'm not just gonna ask you one time because you denied knowing me three times, so let me just, just ask you once for every time, right? It is covered, but what's interesting is that by the third question, Peter's frustrated. And can I just point out, sometimes reinstatement for service can be frustrating. Like if you find yourself sidelined because of sin in your life, getting back to that place where you're being used by God again, it can be frustrating because it takes time and it takes patience. Here's why. Because what you have to do in the process is confront the sin in your life. You can't just fly past it, but you have to deal with it and you have to take time to heal from it. And I have found that the length of time needed for reinstatement usually depends on three factors. Number one, the severity of your sin. So I would say it like this, you know, did you cheat on, cheat on your taxes or did you cheat on your spouse? Did you steal a pack of gum or did you embezzle millions of dollars from your company? Are you tracking with me? The, the severity of sin, number two, is the publicity of your sin. Was the sin that occurred very personal, very private, did it only affect you or did it happen in a very public manner and did it affect the lives of other people? And then number three is the longevity of sin. You know, did this go on for two days or did it go on for two years? We're talking five minutes, we're talking five months. And, and again, all of these factors collectively typically determine the time needed for reinstatement. I'll give you an example of this. Here at Cross Point, if, uh, if you want to be a group leader and you're married, we have a policy that if there has been any sexual misconduct, any sexual infidelity in your marriage, that you must wait at least two years before we'll consider you for group leadership. And can I just say that's not because we're trying to shame you and it's not because we're trying to condemn you, it's just that we believe when something like that happens, a husband and wife need time to confront it. That a husband and wife need time to deal with that to really figure out what was going on under the surface that led to it and caused it. And so we believe that couples need time to process through that so that God can do some work in them. Here's the point I'm trying to make. If you are someone who has failed Jesus and your sin has sidelined you and you're frustrated because you're ready to get back in the game being used by God again, I just want to say be patient with the process. Just be patient. Don't try to rush it. I believe what God is doing is working in you to get you ready for the work he has for you. And by the grace of God, he will get you there. But sometimes it takes time. It took Peter time. Again, Jesus asked him three questions, the three times, same question, to be fully reinstated. But I want to point out the first question because it's a little different than the other two. All right, here's what he says. Do you love me more than these? And there's some disagreement when you read commentaries on this as to what he meant. Did he mean boats and nets? Did he mean fish? Did he mean the disciples? And, and we don't know, but, but I like to think he was talking about the other disciples. I like to think that Jesus looked at Peter and was like, hey man, you love me more than all these other guys? Because when you look back at the evidence of Peter's life before his denial, it sure seems that he did, didn't it? I mean, I know we've talked about this in recent weeks, but think about Peter, only disciple that got out of the boat when Jesus was walking on water. He's like, all right, you other fools can stay here and stay dry. That's where he is. I'm heading out there. And he climbs out and he, he, he pounces upon the wind and the waves. Absolutely amazing. As I said a moment ago, the very first disciple to confess Jesus as the Christ didn't even let anybody else get it out of their mouths. He just went for it. Uh, the night before the crucifixion of Jesus, he sat before him and he said, I don't care what any of these other guys do. I will never fall away from you. And then we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Man, he's chopping dude's ears off for the glory of God out of his love for Jesus, you know, just slicing dude's ears off. He was bad with a knife, by the way. I think he was going for the head. And then what we saw last week, John 21, after the, the early verses, after the resurrection of Jesus, he makes this appearance on the shoreline while the disciples are fishing. And Peter's the guy, when he recognizes it's him, launches himself into the sea and starts swimming in the direction of his Savior and his Lord. You see, I would argue that based on the evidence in Peter's life, it sure seems that he loved Jesus more than the rest, didn't it? And here's the point I want to make out of that. I want to say just a couple things. Okay, number one, some people do love Jesus more than other people. They do. Like, we can't sit in, in rooms like the ones we're gathered in today and just assume that all of us love Jesus the same as everybody else because the truth is we don't. Like, here's reality, all right? There are some people who are here today who are more captivated by Jesus Christ. They're just more enamored by him. 
They're more overwhelmed by him when they think about his grace and his love upon their lives. They have a greater reverence toward him, a greater sense of awe towards him. Some people just love him more. When I was thinking about it this past week, God brought to to mind a guy that I know. He was a dear friend a few years ago, passed away from COVID. His name was Chuck Nida. I know some of you remember Chuck but Chuck was a man, every time I was around him, you know, I just like wanted to get some Chuck Knight on me. You know, you know what I'm saying? He's just one of those guys. Like, I just want to be a little bit more like that guy. And every time I was around him, he was such an encouragement to me. Well, when he was in the hospital suffering from COVID, fighting for his life, his family sent me a picture one day. And here's Chuck in his hospital bed. He's got a, a vent on his face, a bag, like feed him oxygen. He's hooked up to all of these machines And in front of him was a phone playing worship music, and Chuck just has his hands raised, praising the Lord. And I remember when I saw that picture, the impact it had on me, and I just thought in that moment, I want to love Jesus like that. I just want to love Jesus like that guy loves Jesus. And and again, every time I was around, I'm like, I just feel like he loves the Lord more than me. And, And I remember seeing the picture, and I'm like, I just hope that I am a man, even in my worst moments in life, that loves Jesus enough to throw up my hands and to give him the glory and honor he deserves. Amen? Some people love him more than other people. But here's the second thing I want to say. Listen closely. Even those who love Jesus more can fall. They can And Peter's not the only example of this that we see in the scriptures. There are examples all throughout the Bible. One that I thought about this week was King David. You know, King David was the greatest king in the nation of Israel, probably its most famous king. He was the man that God entered into a covenant with to establish his eternal king and kingdom in his world. Like through the line of David would come King Jesus. Do you know that in the Old Testament, David was also called a man after God's own heart, yet at the same time, adulterer? murderer, liar, bad father. And so what I'm telling you is that even the most faithful people can fall. My friends, if you are the person here and you would look around this room and you'd go, yeah, I'm pretty sure I love Jesus more than the other people and the evidence of my life proves it, I would say to you today, don't you dare be proud about it. Take heed, my friend, lest you fall. And can I just remind you, the only reason you love him is because he first loved you? Only reason. It's not like you woke up one day and you were like, I think I'll love Jesus now. No, the only reason you love him is because he came after you. When you were an enemy of God, dead in your sin, helpless to do anything about it, that King Jesus chased you down. And he saved you and he opened your eyes to see your need for him and he brought you into his family and made you a son or daughter of God and then he began to pour out his grace upon your life and when you understand that, what it should cause in you is deep humility, deep humility. It should create in you this deep desire to walk in holiness each and every day so that God is honored through your life. It should lead you to greater surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll say one more thing before we move on, all right? If you are the person in the room, on the other hand, who wants to love Jesus more, and I know there are some of us here who are like that, right? We show up to church, we look around this room, and we're like, dang, all these people raising hands and crying during worship, and like, what's wrong with me? I'm not that, I wanna love him like that. I wanna love him more. Here's what I'd say, here's the key, listen closely. If you wanna love him more, what you must do is plunge yourself into the depths of his demonstration of love for you. I'm talking about the gospel. This is the only way to get this right. Romans 5a, the apostle Paul says that God proved his love or demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you want to grow in your love for Jesus Christ, you have to plunge yourself into that gospel reality each and every day. Like you gotta remind yourself as soon as you climb out of the bed that God loved me at my worst. When I had nothing to offer him, he gave everything to me. And when I could do nothing for God, he gave the life of his own son to make me a son or daughter in his family. Do you know that believing the gospel is not only the way that you enter the kingdom of God, it's how you make progress in the kingdom of God? Like what I'm trying to tell you is that if you wanna grow in your love for Christ, you have to grow in your understanding of his love for you. And in this moment, this love that I'm describing, it's what Peter is experiencing. Like he's getting just a little taste in this moment of the overwhelming, unending, unconditional love of God. Jesus stands before him three times, 
And he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And, and what I appreciate about Peter's response is that he does not appeal to his own works, okay? It's like Peter's like, dude, I chopped a guy's ear off for you, Jesus. How could you ask me a question like that? It's not what he does, but instead he appeals to Jesus' knowledge. This is so key. Jesus, you know that I love you because you know everything. And what he's referring to here is the omniscience of Jesus, the fact that he is all-knowing, that nothing is hidden from him. And so here's the simple point I wanna make, okay? When it comes to your love for God, you can fool everybody else in your life, but you can't fool him. Like, he knows, all right? I'll make it really practical. If you're the person who says you love him, but you don't, he knows. He knows, like, he knows if you're just honoring him with your lips, but your heart's far from him. He knows, all right? Uh, he knows if you are the person who looks like you love him, but you don't really love him. Do you know the kind of person that I'm talking about? This is the person that's in church every week, and they're serving in the ministry, and they're giving their money, and they're doing all the right things, but none of it is for Christ. It's all for them. They're not doing it because they love Jesus. They're doing those things because they love themselves. I just want the approval of man. I want the praise of people. I just want to feel better about the kind of person that I'm trying to be. And so, again, the person who fakes their way through, he knows. But let me comfort some of us, okay? If you are the person who loves Jesus, but you have failed Jesus, and like Peter, man, you're here today, and you are grieved over what you've done, over the sin in your life, over the failure you've committed, but your heart is still set on him. Can I just say, he knows. He knows you love him. And he knows that that thing that you did does not, does not speak of the depths of your love. Like he knows if your heart is truly set on him. And his expectation for those of us who love him is that we would then express our love for him in very, very practical ways, all right? One of the ways that we express our love for Jesus, and we see it in the text, is that we love his people. So if you love Jesus, one of the ways you express it is that you love his people. This is what he calls Peter to do in the moment. And he uses all of this lamb and sheep language, which takes us back to John chapter 10, where he calls himself the good shepherd. And all that language takes us back to Ezekiel 34 in the Old Testament, where God makes a promise to one day send a shepherd for his people. Someone who would come and save his flock and rescue his flock and strengthen the flock and lead the flock. And Jesus announces in John 10, that's me, it's what I've come to do. But here in John 21, this is incredible, he looks at Peter and he says, if you love me, I need you to do that for me. I mean, think about it. He's resurrected from the dead. He's preparing to ascend into heaven. Jesus is leaving. And so the good shepherd looks at Peter and he says, I need you to shepherd my flock. Peter, feed my lambs. And a lamb is a young sheep, so I think he's talking here about new believers, people new to faith. I need you to invest in them. I need you to nourish them, feed them. He's like, tend my sheep. So, so Peter, I need you to make sure that, that general care is provided for my people. Peter, feed my sheep. People who are following me and committed to me, keep providing the nourishment that they need. And I just want to offer a quick side note on this. This is what all church leaders are called to do. Like all pastors, all ministers, every lay leader in the church, and if that's you, this applies to you, every leader in the church is called to shepherd the flock of God for the sake of honoring the good shepherd. First Peter 5, Peter writes about it in verses 1 through 4, and I was reading that text this week as I was preparing, and I just like to think that as Peter was pinning those words, he was thinking about John 21, this moment with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and here's what Peter says to church leaders that we are to shepherd the flock of God in a way that would honor God. That we don't do it in dishonorable ways, that we don't do it for personal gain, that we're not meant to be selfish shepherds, but selfless shepherds, because we understand that one day we will stand before the chief shepherd, this is Jesus, and we will give an account to him for how we led his flock. Can I just say, that's one of the things that motivates me to love you well? Like, come on, man, as your pastor, I love you more than words can express. I truly do, man. It is such an honor to be here as your pastor. But can I just say to you, I love him more than I love you. And it's my love for King Jesus, the good shepherd, that motivates me ultimately to love and to lead you well. But the general application for all of us is the same. I'll say it like this, okay? If you love the good shepherd, you will love his flock. 
If you, as someone who, who loves Jesus, if that's true about you, you really love him, you're gonna love his people. You see, it is very problematic when people make silly statements like this. Well, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate his church. Impossible. It's impossible, okay? Do you know that according to the word of God, the church is the body of Christ and he is the head? Well, do you know that you can't love the body, or excuse me, hate the body and love the head? Impossible. Uh, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ and he is the groom. You can't hate the bride and love the groom. I mean, be like you coming to me and you're like, James, you're my boy, love you, hate Amber, can't stand that shit. <laughs> like, take your shirt off, bro, we're gonna fight right now. I mean, those are fighting words, right? Let's go. I mean, come on, man, you can't say you love me while hating my wife, neither can you say to Jesus, love you, hate your bride. Love you as the good shepherd, but I cannot stand your sheep. Now the point again is simply this. If you love Jesus, you will love his people. But here's the honest reality. That can be really hard at times, right? Because church people can be crazy. Can I get an amen, somebody? I mean, we can, all of us, just like everybody else. I mean, I always laugh when people are like, you know, my problem with the church, James, is that it's full of hypocrites. And I always respond and go, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, let me tell you about, uh, let me tell you something about all these other people in the room that you are surrounded by, in case you don't know it, okay? All of these people were just all broken people in need of the grace of God. Did you know that? Every person in this room, at every location, we're all sinners, we're works in progress, we don't have it all figured out, we're constantly falling short. I mean, we are needy, needy people, aren't we? And so, I mean, of course, we're all hypocritical in some ways. The only difference between us and the rest of the world is that we're actually willing to admit it. Everybody else out there is acting like they got it all together. No, you don't. We're broken. We need the grace of God. But let me just say this. The reason we love his people, even when it's hard, is because it's what he first did for us. Let me just tell you something else about you personally, out of love for you, in case no one's ever told you, all right? You, you do know that you're not all that lovable at times, right? Ah, nervous laughter. Me either, okay? I'm, <laughs> I'm raising my hand with you. I'm, I'm preaching to all of us, but... But let me just be real, okay? Because I love you uh, this much, okay? You, you at times, you can be really difficult. You can be selfish. You can be really hard to get along with. All the whininess and the complaining, that's annoying. All the passive, aggressive kind of stuff, that's super annoying. Like, I mean, at times, you can just be really difficult and unlovable, yet, yet, Christ loved you. When you were at your worst. It ain't like he showed up when we were all killing it, you know? No, he showed up when we were at our worst, completely helpless in every way. And the reason we love the people of God in the way that we do is because God first loved us. Amen? That's expression number one. A second expression of our love is what we see in verses 18 and 19. Jesus goes on, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. And this is John's commentary here in parentheses. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus stands before Peter and he says, because of your commitment to me, you will die for me. It's crazy. He's like, man, when you were young, you were free. Just did whatever you wanted, dressed how you wanted, went where you wanted. He said, when you're old, your freedom's gonna be taking, taken away from you, as will your life. And when you look back on church history and tradition, it is believed that our boy Peter was crucified like Jesus, but that he was crucified upside down at his own request because he did not consider himself to be or worthy enough to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. And I think knowing that makes sense of what John says in parentheses there, that, that his death would ultimately glorify God. And do you know that is the responsibility of every believer in Jesus Christ? to glorify God even in death. That if you belong to Jesus, that when you take your final breath and you leave planet Earth, that the God who you belong to should get glory from you. And do you know the only way to glorify God in your death is to glorify God in your life? Listen, I don't know about you. I don't want anybody lying at my funeral. I've been to some of those, and they're terrible. You ever been to one of these? You're sitting out in the crowd, and you're going, that's garbage. 
Hey, he's not talking about the person I know that's in the box up there because that's not who they were. And, and they're just lying. And, and it just makes me want to throw up the thought of that, you know? That I'm there and they're throwing dirt on me and some dude up there's just lying about me, just, just saying crap about my life that was not true at all. Ah, oh, God forbid. And what I want for my life is they're throwing dirt on me and the guy up there preaching my funeral, whoever he is, is like, I was a good man who lived his life for the glory of God. He loved Jesus more than anything else in life. He was faithful to his wife. He loved her like Jesus loved his church. He loved his daughters and he led them well. He was a humble pastor, loved the people of God and all of his life was devoted to the glory of God. That's what I want. Is that what you want? Like anybody in the house today, you're like, no, that's what I want when they're throwing dirt on me. Yes, here's what I wanna tell you. Here's what it requires, stay with me. That you would follow Jesus in complete surrender all the days of your life. You don't want anybody lying at your funeral? What it requires of you is that as a man or a woman, you would humble yourself before the Lord and say to King Jesus, I will follow you no matter what that means for me. And this is what Jesus calls Peter to in this moment, man. And I want you to think about the tension of this. I imagine this had to be an emotional roller coaster for him. He goes from being established as a leader to denying Jesus to being repentant. He runs back to Jesus. He's restored. Jesus reinstates him for service. And then he's like, hey, man, you're going to die for me. Because of this calling that I am putting on your life, you will give your life for me. And then the next words out of his mouth are, follow me. I would remind us again today that this is the call of discipleship for every believer in Jesus Christ. I think about what Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls you, that is what he calls you to do, to die to yourself. It's the call of Luke 9. It's this core text for our all to him discipleship journey. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And what that means is this, that you and I would forget about ourselves completely. That all of our wants, all of our interests, all of our desires would go on the shelf and we would center our lives on Jesus it means that we would take up our crosses and walk in obedience to him each and every day, no matter the cost, even if it cost us our very lives, and that we would surrender every area of life to the lordship of Jesus, and here's the key, and we do it as a response. Man, this is so important. Don't miss this. The reason you and I take up our cross and follow Jesus is because Jesus took up his cross and died for us. I need you to catch this, man, that, that this call to discipleship is not about you working for something, and it's not about you earning your way into the good graces of God. No, the call to follow Jesus is an act of worship. This is you looking upon the person and work of the sinless Son of God, understanding what he has done to save a wretch like you, and in response to that, handing the reins of your life over to him. Just acknowledging, man, there's nothing better than you. And there's no better way of life than your way of life. And so, Jesus, I will follow you. I want you to rule and reign over me as long as I'm alive so that you are honored and glorified in me. But here's what we learn from Peter, my friends. Listen, there are consequences for doing that. You really want to follow Jesus in that way? There are consequences for doing that. I've told you this before. As your pastor, I don't ever wanna be the shady salesman getting up on this platform and giving you all the good stuff while leaving out the fine print. And so let me give you the fine print once again, okay? If you follow Jesus in full surrender, you will suffer for it in some way. But here's what you gotta know. The consequences are different for different people, all right? Look at verse 20. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So John here is clearing up some confusion. Apparently in the early church, there was a misunderstanding that John would be the disciple that never died, that he would stay alive until the second coming of Jesus Christ, and John just going, that's not what he said, okay? But then verse 24 
this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So imagine the scene, all right? Jesus and Peter are apparently walking down the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee at this point, and John is following behind them. And the description that John gives of himself in this text is one of intimacy. He uses the title, yet again, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, which as I've pointed out, was just his way of acknowledging, I can't believe he would love a guy like me. And I know I've said it at a different point throughout the series, I hope you feel that way. I hope that we're all people who feel that way, that we would see Jesus and look at ourselves and go, I can't believe he would love someone like me. But he also goes back to the Last Supper, when the disciples were gathered in the upper room and John was next to Jesus, leaning back against Jesus, and, and he asked about the betrayer, who would betray him. And then you jump down to verse 24, and you find this statement yet again about John being the one who wrote this incredible gospel. And I believe what he's doing here is making a simple argument, that it is his intimacy with Christ that gives him credibility as a witness. That it's his intimacy with Christ that gives him credibility as a witness, okay? If I can say it another way, what John is telling us is that the reason we can believe his testimony is because of the close relationship he shared with Jesus Christ. All right, think about it like this. This is the difference between you asking a stranger about me and my family about me. If you just find some dude on the street and you're like, hey, what do you know about that James guy? And he's like, I'm, I mean, I think he's okay. You know, whatever. His words carry no weight because he doesn't know me. But if you go and ask Amber and my three girls, hey, tell me about your husband and your dad. And they're like, oh man, we love him and he loves us well and he's a great man and he's a great husband and a great father. Okay, those words carry weight. Why? Because they have a very intimate relationship with me. They know me in a very up close and personal way. I'm just trying to tell you here, John's words carry weight because of the intimate relationship he shared with Jesus. But I would also add that his loyalty to Jesus carries weight. You see, like Peter, John suffered some things for Jesus. This is insane. There's actually historical record that at one point, the apostle John was boiled alive in the city of Rome. Think about that. Somehow, by the grace of God, miracle of God, made it out alive, okay? No life-threatening injuries, boiled alive, and then he was exiled to this little island called Patmos. It's believed that this is where he wrote the book of Revelation, and then eventually John made his way to Ephesus where he died peacefully in his old age. But the point I wanna make is this, what we learned from John, the, here's the application, that it is your intimacy with Christ and your loyalty to Christ that makes you a credible witness, that it is your intimacy with Christ and your loyalty to Christ that, that, that uh, makes you credible as a witness. So in other words, when you follow Jesus and you get punched in the face for it, and you remain loyal to him, even though you're losing some things, you know, like your family thinks you're crazy, so they write you off. And your friends think that you've lost your mind, so they stop inviting you to this stuff. And and your boss fires you because you won't do the unethical thing that he wants you to do, or your reputation takes a shot because you've gone public with your faith, and Christianity is now seen as this really weird, strange thing in our society today. Like, when you follow Jesus and you suffer and you hold fast to him, I'm staying close, I'm remaining loyal, that makes Jesus look very big to an unbelieving world. What it says to people who don't know him, he's the greatest treasure of my life. In fact, he's better than life itself. There's nothing that I would rather have than him. You can take anything away from me, all that the world has to offer. As long as I have him, I'm gonna be okay. And can I just add, I believe this is the type of witness the world needs to see today. Has anybody else noticed the world's gone crazy? Have you noticed this? Like as a society, we have gone completely off the rails. People are believing all kinds of lies about human flourishing and joy and satisfaction. And can I just say, highly unpopular, I believe it's demonic at its very core. All right, that got a few amen. So yeah, highly unpopular, right? But let me keep going. I mean, here's just the truth. We have a very real enemy and all of his little demonic minions who are constantly working to wreck and devastate people's lives. And what they're doing is deceiving people into believing lies about the very nature of life. Everything that God has created, they're trying to tear it down and people are buying it and they're suffering for it. And I believe what the world needs to see from us is what it looks like to be faithful to Jesus even in the midst of a world where it's difficult to do that anymore. Why? Because they need to see what flourishing looks like. 
and the need to see that God's way of life works and that God's way of life satisfies, we need to be credible witnesses. It's what we're here to do. And so here's what's crazy. Peter, Peter looks at John, this credible witness, and dude's just heard he's about to lose his life for the sake of Christ, you know? And what's insane to think about is that he lived under that prophetic word for 30 years. Three decades. Jesus is like, hey man, you're gonna die for me. 30 years later, it happened, and it was all faithfulness in Peter's life. But, but he looks at John, this credible witness, and he's like, well, what about him? Don't you love that? Like all throughout the Gospels, this is Peter. He's like, high moment, low moment. Killing it, crash and burn, and so... He's been restored, reinstated, and now he's comparing himself. Well, G Jesus, what about John? And I love his response. Jesus looks at Peter and he's like, don't worry about John, you follow me. If he's alive until I return, it has no bearing on you. Peter, you just need to be faithful to what I'm calling you to do. And here's the simple point I wanna make. Listen closely. As the people of God, we are all called to the same mission, but after that, there are distinctions. And I'll unpack what I mean, okay? One mission, it's called the Great Commission, that we are in the world to make Christ known to the ends of the earth, but God does put different callings on our lives. Uh, the Spirit of God gives us different spiritual gifts. We're created by God with different natural talents and abilities. The Holy Spirit empowers us to perform different types of ministries, and here's the result of all that. We will suffer different consequences. So let me make it real practical, all right? Um, some of us are just gonna make less money than other people make. I've accepted this as my lot in life, okay? I'm a pastor, so it is what it is, man. Maybe in eternity one day, I'll live on a big house on a lake somewhere, catch a bunch of fish for the glory of God. Amen, God can hope, right? And some of us, is it some of us? our life's just gonna be a little bit more uncomfortable than other people's. Because he's gonna call us to open up our home to the strangers or those foster kids or he's gonna call us to sell some stuff off and to move to the inner city or to move overseas and to go do mission work. Like it's just gonna be a little bit harder. Some of us, our reputation's gonna take a bigger hit because God is gonna call us to more of a public ministry and he's gonna call us to have more of a prophetic voice in a society that is caught up in darkness and we're gonna speak the truth into that darkness and people are just gonna come after us for it. Like I'm just telling you, different consequences for different people. Now, here's what cripples the mission, you ready? Comparison. What slows down the mission of God in the world is when we as his people start looking at other people and we're like, well what about them? I mean, here I am taking it on the chin and they're making all that money and life is easy and you're not asking them to do anything hard. I mean, God, what about them? And what, what, what happens when you compare yourself to other people, this is the danger, discontent starts to set in and then discontent leads to coveting and this is when you start desiring and wanting what God has, has given to someone else and how that all plays out in regards to mission is this. You start, when you begin to covet, you start to pursue a calling that God has not put on your life. And you start trying to do things that you have no business trying to do. You start pretending to have gifts that you don't have because you don't like the ones that you do have. Well, I want theirs and not mine. And, and then you start trying to step into ministry spaces that God has not called you to step into. And the reason for it is that you're trying to manipulate consequences. There's something that you want, in other words. Well, I want to be seen, and I want to be heard, and, and I want my voice to be recognized, and I want the praise of people and the approval of man, or there are things you want to avoid. I don't want to make less money. I don't want all them people in my house. I don't want my life to be uncomfortable. I don't want to take it on the chin, and it's all about minimizing consequences, and I just want to say to you, if that's where you are today, listen again to what Jesus told Peter. You got to stop worrying about everybody else, and you have to follow him. You have to follow him. So let me make it real practical, okay? If God is calling you to foster kids in this season, foster some kids. If God is calling you to make greater sacrifices so that you can give more generously to his church and the spread of the gospel, then make the sacrifices and give more generously. If God is calling you to stop being a coward and disciple some men, stop being a coward and disciple some men.
If God is calling you to sell off everything and to move overseas, sell it off and move overseas. If God is calling you to leave the comfort of the location that you currently attend and to go help us start the next Cross Point City Church location in North Cobb County, then leave the comfort of your location and go with us to help start that church, all right? Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and you follow Jesus, amen? Now, Let me, let me add one final thought, okay? One final thought. You got one shot to get that right. One. I'll tell you this all the time, man, because I love you that much, okay? Uh, it's coming a day when, when life on this earth is through. And if you're lucky, what, I mean, you get, what, like 80 years if you're lucky? Take care of yourself, eat right, work out. Hopefully it all goes well by the grace of God, okay? Your days are numbered anyway, so it's coming. But if you're lucky, you got like 80 years to live a life that would honor and glorify God, and then it's done, and on that day, there are no do-overs. Like, you and I don't get to stand before Jesus one day and go, hey, man, uh, could I go back down there and, and have a few? I think I missed some things. There were some sacrifices I didn't make and, and, and some ministry I didn't perform. There's some things you called me to do. I didn't do those no, on that day, there are no do-overs. I mean, here's the reality, and Jesus alludes to it in the text. There is coming a day in the future when he will return, and he will take his world back. And on that day, we will stand before him and answer for how we spent the one life that he gave us. And do you know the only way to be found faithful on that day is to follow him right here, right now? To stop worrying about everybody else and to do what he's calling you to do to forget about you and to take up your cross and to walk in obedience to the Lordship of Christ each and every day, regardless of the consequences and regardless of what anyone else might choose. I'll close with this, all right? There's one final verse in John. It's verse 25. Here's how he ends it. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did for every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. When I was in seminary several years ago, Dallas Theological Seminary, I was uh, in a gospels class, and it was taught by the president of the seminary at the time. His name was Dr. Mark Bailey, brilliant, brilliant man. And I vividly remember in that class him making the comment that in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the gospel writers only capture 52 days of the life of Jesus. Now listen, I, I don't know if that's true. I don't even know how you figure that out. All I know is that guy's way smarter than me. So I believed him, okay? 52 days of the life of Jesus in all four gospels. And so think about this. John just wrote that Jesus did so many works over the course of his life and ministry that if all of them were written down in books, the world could not contain the books that would be needed. And so it's crazy to think that out of all of those works that the gospel writers narrowed it down to 52 days, and out of those 52 days, the gospel writer John narrowed it down to seven works. Just seven, seven miracles, along with seven statements that Jesus made about himself, his divinity, the fact that he's God, and the purpose of it all was to prove Jesus Christ as the Son of God that we might believe and receive life in his name. That's the purpose of the gospel. I told you this in week one, going all the way back, okay? I also want to repeat what I said about the word believe because John is the gospel of belief. And the word believe in John is pastuo in the Greek. It's an action word. It's a verb, right? It's not something that you have. It is something that you do. It means to entrust and so as we close out this incredible study today, as we sit here on the other side of 60 weeks, okay, if you're like, okay, what should my response be to this book? Here's what we do. We believe. We believe that we would see Jesus, our Savior and our King, pierced for us bleeding for us, that we'd look into the empty tomb and see him resurrected for us, that we would stand on the shoreline and that we would look at this breakfast that he had with his disciples, restoring broken sinners back to fellowship and to service, and that we as his people would believe that we'd entrust our lives to him in faith, that we would follow him no matter what it means. And so as we respond today, here's the simple invitation. Would you examine your life? In light of what we've seen, would you look at your marriage and your money and the way that you parent and your work and single people you're dating life and the way you love your neighbors and 
and anything that's going on in the backstage of your life that nobody else knows about, would you just examine every area of your life and ask the question, is there anything I'm holding back? Is there anything that I have not laid down at the feet of Jesus so that I can faithfully follow him? And if there's something there, I would just invite you today, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, to release it, to lay it down, okay? We're gonna sing a song to close like we always do. If you need to come and pray, just get out of your seat, come to the front of any of these rooms. We have carpets available if you just wanna come and kneel and pray. But let me pray for us and we're gonna respond, okay? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for its power. And we thank you for Jesus, the word. God, I pray today that by your spirit that you would expose us in love. Help us to see any area of our lives that we're still holding on to. We wanna be faithful witnesses. We wanna follow Jesus in full surrender. We want you to receive glory. God, we wanna flourish, not only for our sake, but for the sake of your world. We, We wanna be people who put you on display before others who desperately need you. So, Father, I just pray you do a work in us today, God. We love you. Thank you for grace. And, God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond.